So, uh, my name's Shamir. I'm the MD and founder at Growth Gorilla. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, with me, I have got uh, Jane Hunt, um, founder and CEO at JBH. I'll, Jane, I'll allow you to intro yourself and, and intro JBH. Thank you. Yeah, so my name's Jane. I'm the CEO of JBH, and we are a digital PR and SEO agency. And we specialize in digital PR for personal finance brands. Um, and we've done kind of uh, PR campaigns for the likes of Money Supermarket, Nerd Wallet, Select Car Leasing, Money.co.uk, Uswitch, Confuse.com, and many more over the years. So hopefully I'm going to share a wealth of information with you about, uh, and well, and some tips and tricks about digital PR campaigns for finance brands. Amazing. Thanks, Jane. And um, Julia, um, I'll allow you to introduce yourself. Of course. Hi, I'm Julia. Head of Influencer Marketing and Creative Strategy here at Growth Gorilla. I work with Shamir. I've uh, been working in the influencer marketing industry for about seven years now. I've gone through entertainment, beauty, fashion, food, and now fintech. So done it all, seen it all. Amazing. And uh, yeah, just a little bit about Growth Gorilla. Uh, we're a growth marketing agency. We specialize in the fintech and financial services area. Um, we work with over 40 fintech brands um, to date. Um, and our main areas of focus, performance marketing, influencer marketing, um, a spot of creative and uh, also some conversion rate optimization. Um, so today we're going to talk about digital PR and influencer marketing. Um, just a very sort of quick order of um, events. Um, so we'll kick off with um, almost like a, a Q&A panel uh, with Julia. We'll talk about influencer marketing, probably do that for about 20 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll move over to Jane and we'll talk about uh, digital PR. Uh, and that should allow a little bit of time at the end for any questions. Um, if you do have any questions, um, I believe there is uh, the ability, as there is with all of these webinar sort of um, platforms, to ask any questions. Um, if uh, it seems pertinent at the time to answer it there and then, we will. Um, otherwise, we'll uh, save them for the end. Um, and that's that. And without much further ado, we'll we'll get started. Um, so, Julia, uh, let's let's talk influence marketing. Are you ready? Let's do it. <laughs> so ready. Cool. Um, so, a very broad question, um, but very pertinent. Um, can you just take us through the the fundamentals uh, of what influence marketing is, um, and, and, and the fundamentals of influence marketing in general? Yeah, of course. Um, as you said, it is a broad question. So there's only so much I guess I can put into that for an answer. Um, but influencer marketing, uh, fairly new now, not as much of a new concept. It's been changing for the past couple of years. Uh, it, it progresses it and regulations gets into everything. Um, but in a nutshell, it's adding that human factor into your branding, finding ambassadors for your brand, your company, people that resonate with your product, with your services, um, and that have an audience that will match your target audience as well, and that they can talk about it in a genuine way and sell your product, but beyond it, create awareness around that product slash service. Amazing. And what one of the areas I want to get into, and I think it's always a good place to start, is to um, talk about some of the misconceptions um, around influencer marketing. Um, so I think best place to start really, I think, is, you know, could you talk us through how you sort of differentiate between, say, affiliate marketing and, and influencer marketing? Yeah, I think affiliate marketing has more to do with the bottle of the funnel. Uh, where you're trying to convert. Uh, not to say that you can't do that with influencer marketing, but I think it's a bit more of a process, especially if you're looking into getting true brand ambassadors um, for your company. With influencer marketing really is about adding the human factor, as I said, and furthering those relationships. So whereas with affiliate, where you have someone talk about your product and directly sell it to their audience, uh, through a link or whatever it is with influencer marketing, the opportunities and options are much broader. Um, and you don't necessarily need to shove 
a product slash service into people's faces to create a campaign. Uh, whereas with affiliate is a lot more direct and people know that they are getting sold something and it can work, but it doesn't serve the exact same purpose. Amazing. And so, so I think, you know, with affiliate marketing, obviously it's a performance channel. So it's very easy to sort of see that, um, that ROI directly to a degree. Um, from an influencer marketing perspective, uh, you mentioned it's more about sort of brand awareness, uh, as opposed to obviously that, that you know direct sales. Um, you know, what what should brands expect to see in terms of and, and I suppose how should they measure their ROI with influencer marketing? Yeah, I mean you can you can measure that in a couple of direct ways, like you can with affiliate, you can add UTM links, uh, you can see direct engagement click-through rates, you can do all of that even if it's not um, directly converting. But the thing with influencer marketing that's a bit trickier is especially because you're dealing with people that have core audiences that trust what these people are saying and that they, um, it's almost like getting a celebrity uh, to talk about your product, obviously within very different scales, depending on the followings that you are dealing with. But um, that necessary, if you see an ad on TV, for example, the person is not going to buy that product through the ad on the television, but it implements a seed into their little brain. And the next time they see it at the mall, next time they come across an ad on Meta, um, they will think of that person and, oh, like they recommended it. I might go and purchase that now. So you will see that conversion later on and in different ways that are not as direct, but it adds that factor into it. So I'd say in the beginning, when you are at the awareness stage, look at engagement rates, look at if people are commenting around the the deliverable being sold there. So if a creator uh, posts a video about your brand, what are people saying? Are they commenting something that has nothing to do with your product, your service, your brand, or are they truly engaged with it? Um, that's a great indicator that they are on the right path. Um, equally pay attention. Like if you see spikes into your sign up sales, whatever it is, depending on your niche, um, and you can't really point out where it's coming from, it might be coming from that because they've seen it at some point and they're now later on converting. Cool. Uh, and then I think also just, just, yeah, you talked about obviously, you know, seeing sales come in, um, uh, perhaps from, from other channels that you can't measure. Um, I think one of the things though as well is is the time frames. Obviously, I think with again kind of comparing it to affiliate, um, you know, affiliate being quite direct, you know, you can almost get you know affiliate activity kind of running up really quickly uh, and starting seeing results from that, you know, fairly sharpish. How does that compare to to influencer marketing? And what are sort of the realistic time frames um, that brands should sort of expect and consider? I think one, it really depends on the goal of your campaign. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, we all want to convert, we want more customers, we want more leads. Um, but if it is an awareness campaign, treat it as an awareness campaign. Make sure that your target audience becomes aware of your product, more familiar with your brand, what it is that you do, what you're trying to sell them, why it is that it benefits them. I think we sometimes miss the part where we need to build that relationship and nurture the audience into understanding what it is that that service is a great fit for them. Um, it's something that it may not work for everyone, but why it is that it works for you. And I think that is that is a great part of the narrative that influencers can tell that sometimes you can't tell through ads or affiliates. Um, so we so we can't miss that. And I think in terms of time frame, it really depends on what it is that you were trying to sell. I think it's a very different story to try and promote a bag through an influencer. I don't really have to think a lot about a bag. Do I want it? Do I not? I may purchase it. It's kind of like a quick thought. But if I am going for um, a financial service, um, do I want to open a bank account here? Do I need that mortgage? Do I want to get into crypto? Those are decisions that take a lot more thought um so make sure to as i said nurture that audience explain it very well through your campaign why it is that they may need and why it would benefit them um and that timeline may look a little a little longer for that reason but 
with the right steps, the right creators optimizing throughout the campaign, you will get to the results in the end. Amazing. Um, I mean, that brings us sort of nicely into, I suppose, um, speaking about sort of fintech and financial services, specifically in influencer marketing. Now, influencer marketing has been around for, you know, quite some time. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the, the fashion brands do it for, you know, for, for years. Why, why do you think, you know, fintech and financial services as a whole lag, you know, behind having adopted influencer marketing? Yeah, I think the main reason, and as I, I could spot from the get-go, is the whole compliance story of things. It's, it's hard to build um campaigns that sound exactly how we want them to uh, because of compliance and the things that you can cannot say and how you can sell certain things uh, for financial services. Um, and that makes it scary. It makes it complicated. We're talking about big numbers. And as I said, it's not as quick of a route and as linear. So potentially, I guess, marketeers might want to invest in something else. And so they are a little behind the curve. Um, as we talked about fashion, it's a lot easier for me to think, okay, I need that bag for the summer, but I'm not too sure about my mortgage. Um, in another area as well, and I think recently we've been looking into this, is that it's about educating creators as well um, about what they're getting themselves into. It's a lot more complicated to be the ambassador for a financial service than it is for a fashion brand um, but once again if you get the right creator the right audience match the right campaign in place the right narrative there's no reason why it couldn't work it's just a little bit trickier and i think fintechs haven't quite grasped that yet but the more they see other fintechs doing the more natural it becomes and, and do you think um aside from the you know complexity of financial products and the compliance considerations. Do you think there's sort of any other areas at all where, you know, or reasons why fintechs aren't leveraging influencer marketing? Or, or do you think, you know, those are the two core reasons? I think that those are the main reasons and why it doesn't go any further. But I think that, for example, it's all very direct when it comes to financial services, right? And I can see the reason why, once again, we convert back into compliance and the things that can and cannot be said and trying not to get ambiguous there. Um, but especially with influencer marketing, people are trying to buy into a lifestyle. How could that benefit my way of living, my day to day? Even if we're talking about as simple of a product, I'll give the bag example once again, so things sound quite lim linear. Um, how would that bag benefit my day to day? Well, I like the bag, the bag looks fashionable. I can see myself strolling about the street with the bag. My favorite influencers are wearing it. Like it's, it's easy to picture that. And I think fintechs have, they go through the difficulty of how do I implement that into people's lifestyles while dealing with compliance and while not trying to directly push something into someone. And the more that we can stay away from, hey, here's a product that works for you, go and sign up for it um, and showcase how that would benefit people's day to day, the better. Cool. Um, I want to take a quick detour into, you know, for, for a reason, um, a, a quick detour into just talking about organic social media activity, um, because this has kind of come up a lot with with our clients um, that want to implement, obviously, influencer marketing. And then one of the first things we'll do is we'll, um, you know, we'll take a look at their, their existing social channels, their, you know, their TikToks, their, their Instagrams, their YouTubes. And, you know, it'll be fundamentally, it'll be, de it'll be desolate. There won't be any content there. Um, and you kind of always, you know, raise that as a bit of a red flag. Um, you know, how important is it and why is it important to have a, a solid foundation uh, for, for organic social media? First of all, I believe it's very important. Um, if you are working with digital marketing and people are staying online to find your product, your service, even if you are finding it through a normal Facebook ad, 
um, my initial instinct is to stay within the platform. It's kind of native to the user to stay within the platform when finding something, especially through influencer marketing, where it is a lot more human based. Um, my intent is not to leave the platform and go elsewhere. If I'm scrolling on TikTok, if I'm watching videos on YouTube, if I'm catching up with my friends on Instagram, my time to go elsewhere is different. I want to stay within the platform. So when I see a creator talking about a product slash service on their page, I don't want to be taking away from that platform. I want to be able to stay there and understand what that product is about. Therefore, I would expect that the creator tags the brand. If they're tagging the brand and there is nothing there to be seen, we have a problem. If there is something to be seen, but it doesn't tell me a lot, we also have a problem. And as I was saying with influencer marketing and the awareness bit, it's all about understanding who that brand is beyond just exactly what it is that they do and what they offer. But why would I sign up to this digital bank as opposed to the other one? What have they got to offer me beyond a few benefits that most of them will offer? What are they like personality wise? Um, have they got anything that I can resonate with? And I think that those things are very looked upon amongst fintechs, for example. Uh, we don't usually think about that. We just think about the benefits um, that are very direct. And it's exactly what I was talking about. How can we make those brands and companies a little more human and give more information there? And of course, talk about the benefits, of course, talk about the very direct things, because that's important as well when someone is making the decision about signing up for a service, but um, I think that that lacks a lot. And if I go into a creator's page, I see them talking about a company and how great it is and how it has improved their life. And then I go into the company's page and there's not a lot there to be said. Was it just a good script? Do I really resonate? I don't know. So I think it's important that the whole narrative, it's kind of circular and inclusive. Right. And so I'm sort of move back into the influence, you know, talking about influence marketing. Um, again, one of the questions that kind of crops up quite consistently is, you know, what what platforms should we be focusing on? Um, what platforms should fintechs and financial services brands be focusing on, Julia? Um, to make things easier. I'd say it's important for everyone to have an Instagram because even though things are progressing other ways, I think everyone just kind of looks for an Instagram because it allows you to have it all. It allows you to have highlights, statics, videos, the whole thing. It kind of works as a second website of sorts. Um, and a lot of influencer marketing is still done there. Although we are moving into TikToks, YouTube is great for longer format videos. You can get Twitch, you can get Twitter, you can get all sorts. Um, but then beyond that, it really depends on who your target audience is and where they spend their time. You need to do that research. If you can be on every single platform, if you have a great social media team in-house and you can afford to be in every single platform and update them and make sure that the content is there and work with creators in every single platform, by all means, go for it. I think it can work in every single platform. But if you have to choose a few because of resources, just go where your audience is and make a count. And I said that, that that leans nicely into asking, you know, what um, what sort of content should brands be producing? Um, and then come to add another layer to that, um, you know, how do they stop themselves from, you know, producing content or posting content for the sake of it? Yeah, I think it's important to understand what it is that your audience or your leads. Um, don't quite get about your product. Do some really interesting educational work around that. Tell more about your company. Um, I think every company has a story and a personality beyond the product that they're selling. Um, and that's really interesting to see is how people resonate with things and why we might choose a company as opposed to another that essentially offers the same service. Um, so focus on that, obviously focus on being clear, especially if we're talking FinTech, you have to be clear on what it is that you offer and the benefits and whatnot, what the services are, that's important. And it's about constantly reminding your audience as well, because you never know who's coming through that day. 
don't think that, oh, just because I've said that once, I don't have to say it again, especially with social media, things get lost the more you post. So it's not like a website where it's all very direct and it stays where it is. Um, so recycle content in various different ways. You can talk about the same thing in different formats over and over again. It could be a workshop, it could be an educational video, it could be a UDC piece, it could be an influencer. Um, post where they kind of do it in as to how they incorporate a service into their lives. Um, it could be a carousel grid with information, market updates. It could be all sorts. It really depends on your product. And the, I think the other thing that we've all seen is, um, I, I, saw, I saw one this morning, actually, I won't mention the brand, um, but it was a, it was a well-known meme that they posted up and I thought that it, it made me cringe um what's your view on on i suppose trend hopping and trying to chase virality and and you know trying to be cool i think it's important to spot what trends will work for your service and what resonates with your audience if you have a really young audience um like if your audience is gen z based and they're constantly hopping on trends themselves. And maybe it's important that you do. It's important that you speak the same lingo. But if you are not targeting that, then why it is that you're doing, even if you get the views, are they going to convert into customers? Probably not, and it's just gonna look a little weird. Also understand what trends actually benefit your company in the sense of what story can you tell through that trend? Are you just doing it for the sake of it? Or can you actually optimize that so that it benefits you? And being able to spot those, um, it's really important. And it's all I can really say. Cool. Um, so one of the uh, one things you mentioned, uh, a bit of a buzzword was UGC. Yeah. Um, and this is something that, that, that comes up a hell of a lot, especially because we, we do paid as well. Um, what is the difference between, I mean, first and foremost, you know, what is user generated content and how is that different from influencer generated content? Yeah. I mean, you would think that user generated content is user generated content. Um, and now we've changed that to CGC, which is customer generated content. So when it's CGC is your actual customer generating content around uh, your product slash service, but UGC, you're technically paying for someone to, that can be, highly scripted or fairly scripted um, to talk about your product. Um, I think it's very different from influencer marketing in the sense that influencer marketing is to, it's meant to be the genuine opinion of an ambassador for your brand. Obviously, chances are they will like your brand if they're partnering up and talking about it and selling it to their audience. Um, that's how it should go. So it's not like they're going to say bad things about it, but it's how they implement it into their lives. Now with UGC, it's more so for the average example of how anyone could implement that into their lives. Um, and it's really good for educational content. Um, so for example, if you have no one in your company that could explain how certain things work, how certain features work, how an app might work, um, get a UGC creator to do that for you, script it out, and boom, there you go. It's a lot cheaper than influencer marketing because you're not using that creator's audience. That content is to be used either on your organic channels or for paid activity, but it's not to go on a creator's page. So you're not leveraging off of their audience. You can put paid behind it and then get it wherever you want it to go. Um, and I think what it has in common with influencer marketing is the human factor that we sometimes miss and if you can't go the influencer marketing route because it might be longer, it might be more expensive, then UGC is a great alternative to that. And, and how, you know, how can you mix in UGC into, I suppose, I mean, not just influencer marketing, but also, you know, you know, how can it be leveraged for, for influencer? How can it be leveraged for, for paid and organic? As I said, I think it's a great way to add the human factor to it. I think static ads can get really boring. Sometimes doing animation can get a bit complicated and we don't always want to sit down and watch an entire animated ad. That's just a lot of selling. UGC comes across as a little more natural than that. 
Um, equally is an easy way to explain things, as I said. So I think it's really important for organic beyond paid because paid usually has to be quite quick. Uh, but with organic, you can get that to be a lot more thorough. Um, with influencers, it's, it's something we usually discuss internally. There's a bit of a fine line there between licensing content from influencers and getting it across to paid. What's the difference between that and UDC? But as I said, if you're associating the person's image to your brand and using them as an ambassador, that's influencer marketing. If you're just using the creator to create a piece of content and explain what it is that the service is about and get it out there, but it it's not correlated to their image or their audience, then that's UDC. And I think the two go very well together. They're just not the same thing. And, and in, in your view, um, you know, how do you, you know, how does the type of content being produced um, differ um, in UGC versus, say, content for, for, for influencer marketing? Yeah, I think you have a lot more say in what UGC content looks like, um, because as I said, I mean, obviously, influencer content can be scripted. It just doesn't come across as really natural. And because they're dealing with their audience, one, influencers usually don't agree to that. They know what their audience likes best. And two, if it doesn't come across as genuine and you're trying to sell a product or a service through an influencer so that their audience buys into it, if they don't believe in it, then it's just simply not going to work. Now, with UGC, it's a different story. Um, I think with influencer marketing, it works really well when you, obviously there's a brief, there's things that can and cannot be said, uh, especially when dealing with fintechs, but give your creator a little bit of freedom and creative freedom even is to what they want to produce and what will resonate with their audience. Um, integrations work really well in that sense, seeing content that's already native to their audience and then your brand gets, gets fit nicely into it. Um, and then with UGC, use it more on the educational side of things to promote features, as I said, explain how things work through a video, uh, use it for quick uh, paid videos as well. I think they serve different purposes there. Amazing. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, so th there's been a couple of questions um, that have popped up. Um, what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll save them for the end. Um, I'll also allow Julia to take a moment to catch her breath and uh, uh, read through the questions, um, and we'll circle back to them um, in, in about 20 minutes or so. Um, but Jane, let's let's move over and start talking a little bit about digital PR. I've been sitting there very patiently. So uh, uh, to kick things off, you know, um, can you give us an overview of? of what digital PR is and how it differs from, from traditional PR? Yeah, sure. So this is kind of one of the biggest questions we get, really. And kind of my definition of digital PR is kind of borrowing from traditional PR to meet kind of SEO objectives. So that means that kind of our objectives are from SEO teams mostly, and that's to help them build their visibility in organic search. And we do that through the creation of kind of PR led campaigns. It might be creative, it might be data led, there might be kind of a quirky story, case studies, whatever it might be. But we're, we're borrowing from traditional PR techniques in how we're pitching, how we're talking to the press in order to meet those SEO objectives. Having said that, as digital PR is progressing, we're also looking at kind of the additional or wider marketing benefits um so you know how we're positioning that brand in search so it just it does tap back into a traditional pr and brand PR. we're also looking um at kind of how we can hit wider marketing goals like e-newsletter signups whether we can impact inquiries and sales and things so it's not just a link building exercise anymore although those links are still you know very valuable we can also, you know, reach wider goals and have more of a holistic impact on marketing as a whole. Cool, thank you. Um, so to, then, to, to get into the nuts and bolts of it, um, I mean, what I mean, what are the benefits of brands in, you know, particularly in financial services, um, you know, to invest in digital PR? Yeah. 
So obviously there's the benefit of the backlinks. So, you know, increasing rankings in search, either for the domain overall or for specific keywords, products, services, etc. So getting more traffic to those pages. Um, and then there's also kind of, you know, building awareness. And this is where the traditional PR comes in. So, you know, we're reaching target audiences or well, the aim is to reach target audiences to build that credibility for the brand and also build trust at the same time, especially for financial services. I think that's really important. Um, so, yeah, it can be kind of multiple, but also there's kind of positioning work we're doing as well. So how the brand wants to be positioned uh, within its coverage, within search, et cetera, as a whole, and how they want to be seen by their target audience. And, and similar question that, that, that I, uh, I put to Julia, um, you know, particularly, you know, pe people kind of always ask this question around PR, but, you know, how do you measure the success of, of PR campaigns and, you know, specifically digital PR campaigns? So there's a few kind of common KPIs that we tend to look at for most brands, not just kind of personal finance brands. But they tend to be they tend to relate to backlinks so that might be the quantity of backlinks that a campaign can generate the quality of those backlinks so the quality of the publications where we're earning those backlinks from um, and also the relevance of those publications and if you can hit all three then that's amazing but there's been a bit of a shift over the years away from just focusing on the quantity of backlinks to focusing on quality and relevance and if you're going to earn those backlinks, make sure you're earning them from the most authoritative publications, have the most relevance to your brand and to your target audience, and also where that target audience is going to be sitting. So if you drive any referral traffic through those backlinks, it's really relevant to the page they're going to be landing on. And you know, what, what's, what's the starting point with digital PR? You know, how can a brand get started? Good question. So, I mean really it's kind of looking at what you want to achieve from digital pr so what is most important is it a quantity of links are you hoping to drive kind of links to a specific product or service page and once you kind of know what you're aiming to do then you can look at kind of what kind of campaign to put together and how you're going to get there and one of the things we like to do when we onboard a client is discuss kind of their topical expertise and this kind of relates to the key products that they might want to kind of promote or build links to and what internal expertise they have that can back up the content that they might want to create for these campaigns. So it's kind of looking at uh, what authority they have in that space and they might be experts in credit cards or they might be experts in kind of loans for cars or whatever it might be and looking at how much content that they have to uh, use for that purpose, what internal experts they have that could provide kind of opinions, uh, what data they have on those topics. And that's really important too. If they've got unique data, then that's amazing because journalists love anything that's unique and a unique perspective. But also to think about kind of if that brand has a standpoint. And this can be hard in financial services, but occasionally we come across a brand that says, look, we are pro this or we're anti this and we want to push this. This is our standpoint. We want everyone to know that maybe, you know, we don't like buy now, pay later or whatever schemes, or whatever it might be. And they're happy to kind of uh, be in that zone and they're comfortable kind of having an opinion. And that opinion and having that viewpoint is going to help them kind of build um, build a brand with journalists and also give them that unique kind of point of view and also that trust as well. If you've got a finance brand that says, I, we believe in this and this is and we're putting everything behind this, um, despite what others might think, then that automatically kind of wins credibility with journalists and with audiences, too, because at the end of the day, everyone's looking for a fresh perspective and you know brands to have that standpoint to believe in something to have a vision and to own it so i've got, I've got a sort of a um a bit of a double barrel question here um so you know sort of 
question number one is, you know, what will happen to brands that that don't invest in digital PR? And it's sort of in parallel, you know, there's a lot of sort of smaller brands out there that will be thinking, well, you know, how do I then actually, if I do invest into digital PR, you know, how am I going to compete with with, with, with bigger brands? So uh, to simplify that, you know, what happens if you don't invest in digital PR and then how can a smaller brand compete with a, with, yeah. with a larger brand? Yeah. And I completely understand that small brands might think that there's no point even investing in digital PR. There's no way they can compete with some of the huge finance brands out there. However, there are opportunities even for small brands. And when you're looking at kind of a strategy for digital PR for small brands or challenger brands, it's looking at where the gaps are within kind of backlinks. So what gaps or what backlinks do your competitors not have? Where are they not pointing links to on their site that you can capitalize on? So they might not have focused on a particular product. You might have a new product that nobody else has or be offering it in a different way. So that's your opportunity from a search and digital PR perspective. So we can put campaigns together around that to be able to rank for that product or however it's offered that's different and also looking at where you can gain links from that your competitors don't have links from as well. So no brand has covered absolutely everything. So there's always opportunities. It's just about looking at kind of the detail and seeing kind of what you can do. And, and you, you know, you've you talked to obviously a huge amount about, about backlinks and, and obviously in ranking. Um, and you said that some companies have, you know, a target based upon quantity, some on quality. Um, and then almost like going back to the smaller brands uh, and looking at them, um, you know, I suppose, A, what's more important, you know, quantity or quality? And then do you need, you know, thousands of links to yeah. then rank for specific, you know, a specific set of keywords or a specific keyword? This is, this is where it gets really interesting for small brands. So there's an opportunity by targeting really relevant publications to build rankings quite quickly. And there's a myth that you need hundreds of thousands of backlinks to compete. I mean, you, you do in terms of kind of, you know, branded search, et cetera, and, um, you know, ranking for really competitive kind of keywords and products. However, if you're quite niche and you're offering something a bit differently and there are those gaps, you, you can find that kind of a handful of links from some, some truly relevant authoritative publications can actually have a big impact on your product and service rankings. And you can outcompete much bigger competitors and you can impact inquiries and sales as well. So it is definitely worth doing. And I wouldn't be put off because you think you can't compete with much bigger brands that have been established for, you know, 50, 100 years or whatever it might be. Cool. Uh, Jane, thank you very much. No problem. Um, so uh, we've had a few questions. Um, if you've got any more, uh, feel free to sort of note them down in, in the question section and we'll, we'll work our way through them. Um, I think the first one is is very much, uh, well, actually, um, could be applicable to both, really. Um, how do you feel? What are your thoughts on AI-generated content? Um, Jane, do you want to take that one? <laughs> I'd love to, yeah. So this is a really interesting one for us because a lot of agencies are testing how they can use AI-generated content as part of PR campaigns. Um, and there's certainly um, potential for using AI to put together content. However, it all depends on the quality of the brief that you give it and the quality of the information that it kind of kicks back at you. And I think it's very important, especially for finance brands and healthcare brands, that that information that it gives you is correct and credible. Because if it's not, it's a disaster for finance brands. And I know that Google has concerns about using AI content to uh, for search results for finance brands because, you know, it can't make a mistake in that respect. So there's a lot of work to be done on AI um, for kind of these types of sectors. Um, so I definitely think it's interesting. Uh, we're testing out how we can use AI as part of as part of campaigns. 
Um, but I don't think it's there yet. I think what will be interesting is what journalists do and whether they can tell when they're being pitched any kind of AI generated content um, and imagery and how, how authentic things are, um, you know, and whether they're receiving a pitch from a brand that's authentic or not. So there's lots of things to come up from this that I think will be really interesting. But there's certainly a lot of testing going on, so it's an interesting time. And Julia, what are your thoughts? Different type of content, I imagine. Um, yeah. I've heard a lot about um, people saying, oh, will influencers be replaced with AI as they generate things and like celebrities in people's face and all the sorts of things that you can possibly think of. And first of all, um, it's, how did we get here? But secondly, um, I think it can serve different purposes. Um, AI, in my opinion, might compete with UGC, for example, in the sense that you can get an AI figure um, to explain something, to create that piece of educational content, to kind of add ease of use to things. Um, but it will never be the same as an influencer in terms of trust and that visibility. I mean, you get AI gen generated influences. We've had it for years now. I think it's called Lil Michaela. Um, it doesn't sound the most professional, but Lil Michaela has millions and millions of followers and she's been around for ages and people kind of, they, they know she's not real, um, but they take her as an influencer. But then will you go through the routes of creating an entire influencer for your brand and put the work into it for years and years on end until you build an audience? Maybe not, but you could use an AI generated persona to be kind of like the face of your brand and explain products and features and take a, a fun twist to it. I think we'll see more of that happening, but it won't really compete with influencer marketing for the purposes that it serves. Um, and then move on to a, another question by Ali. Um, again, uh, focusing on, on influence marketing. Uh, what's your process for assessing how influencer marketing fits as part of a comprehensive channel strategy? Uh, taking into consideration timing, proportion of investment of time and money versus other channels? I think we need to start with two questions, um, the two being the most important and then kind of narrow it down from there. One, uh, where are the blockers? Is it that your service, your company doesn't have enough awareness, or enough trust? Then influencer marketing is kind of like the perfect answer for that. There are certain things that influencer market can um give you in terms of content that other means con. Um, but if it's more on the educational side, people just don't understand the product, um, there's other routes to go about that. If you just want a larger audience, you could get some UGC, put a lot of paid behind it, distribute it widely. Um, if it's because you want to get into a specific audience and there are creators that talk directly to that audience, then it's also a great way to do it. Um, and then the second question is, the budget, which is kind of like the direct question to ask. If your budget is kind of narrow, I would potentially give you other routes. Um, if you have enough budget to play with, then a Sora awareness through conversion campaign is a great way to approach it. Um, and equally, it really depends on the product and the service that we're trying to get out of that campaign in itself. Um, if it's a well-known brand aware already, you don't really need to educate people on what it is that you do, but potentially you want to use influencers for a particular launch or to get into a new audience that doesn't work for you just yet, but you think it could and a certain creator is perfect for it and there's no other way to do it. So it really depends on what is the goal there and what can we get out of it and if you can pay for that. I, I think that's, that's, I think, you know, that, that's probably relevant for any channel that you're choosing. And when you're doing any form of media planning, um, you know, I've told this, you know, shamelessly from one of our clients, but I think it's a great way to, to describe it. And she calls it her marketing onion. And you think of all of the, the rings within an onion as your different audiences. And the closer you get to the center of that onion, that's your highest intent. Um, and really what you want to be doing is, is, is hitting the highest intent audience and then working your way outwards. And then I think the only other sort of parameters we then put on to that is what budget that you have available. So an example is, is that actually your highest intent audience may be on 
um, I don't know, let's say TV, for example, but as a capital cost, it's too high. So you may go for a slightly less higher intent audience, um, which may, you know, for example, be influencer, but it's allowing you to reach that audience at a, at a, a better cost or, or the unit metrics might be working, you know, might be better for you. Yeah, and I was thinking about how you can optimize that as well, because influencer and UGC, for example, give you a couple routes beyond the initial content being posted. So we always take that into consideration as well. What can we do with that content beyond the campaign? And I think it's it's a good way to start. I was going to say, Jane, you looked like you were about to add, add something there. Or just... No, no, I was just, I was just agreeing. <laughs> good. So, uh, so, yeah, we've got a couple more sort of um, PR-focused questions. Um, Jane, how do you demonstrate digital PR value to your clients? You know, what metrics are you using to report on, uh, IE or EG, number of links, uh, DR, DA, traffic, etc.? Yeah, good question. So we have kind of the basics that we are accountable for in terms of like a quantity of links, uh, a minimum domain authority for those links. So we're not, you know, earning any spammy links, etc. We want the best quality possible. We measure links in terms of domain authority or domain ranking, depending on what the client wants. But we're also looking at additional metrics. So strategically, uh, we want to focus on increases in keyword rankings, uh, increases in organic traffic. We're also looking at referral traffic and we're also looking to optimize those campaigns for inquiries, sales, e-newsletter signups, whatever else we can do kind of on site to maximize kind of traffic and link equity as part of campaigns. So it's not just a question of building links. It's actually the impact of those links. So over the, over the past year, we've done a lot of work to actually showcase the, the bigger value of link building activity, I guess. Um, so we're looking at a range of SEO metrics. So like I said, DA, DR, um, you know, anchor text, we're looking at link type, we're looking at the um, authority of the publication, the relevance of that publication. And then we've also got the PR brand side. So we're looking at how the brand is positioned in that piece of coverage, whether they're the only brand that features in that round, in that coverage, or if it's a roundup and there's additional brands, we're looking at if we've showcased expertise within that coverage too. So if we've got, you know, somebody from the brand mentioned as part of that, so we're kind of ticking these brand um, objectives as well. And um, yeah, so we do a roundup at the end of a campaign or the end of like a quarter where we can show kind of all these metrics and hopefully the added benefit of building these links. Um, that's the aim anyway. Um, and there's one more sort of uh, PR question, uh, digital PR question, which is um, why will the journalists or publications be interested in SEO focused digital PR? Um, good question. They weren't always. And, <laughs> and that's where, and that's where the content is really important. And it's not just about kind of pitching a piece of SEO optimized content that links to an SEO strategy. It's about thinking about that journalist, what that journalist covers, what their audience is interested in, um, what's going to get the most engagement and making sure what you're pitching is timely. Um, so how can you relate it back to what's going on in the media at the moment or how can you make it timely yourself um, and also kind of making sure it's unique. So, again, have you got any unique data you can offer the journalist? Is there a unique perspective? So if you're a finance brand, it's coming up to the budget. Is there any kind of um, can you have you got any suggestions? Can't think of the word I'm looking for. Um, but have you got any suggestions on what's going to happen and how people can prepare for the budget? Um, do you have kind of any data that you can offer that adds to the budget once it's released or anything else? I think the more unique you can make it, the more focused you can make it and to make sure that there's an, a clear angle in there. And that's obvious kind of in the subject line and then also within the body copy of the outreach email as well. So it's really clear what you're offering the journalist, that you're an expert in your field and uh, what they can get from it. Amazing. Thanks, Jane. Um, there's a couple more uh, follow-up question uh, to, to, uh, to the previous one. 
what kind of digital PR goals, KPIs do you set with your clients each month? Oh, it, it depends, which is a good SEO answer. But it depends on what the client wants to achieve. It depends on the size of the account. It depends on quite a few things. But like I said, as an agency, we've got a lot of focus on the relevance and the quality of the, um, the coverage and the backlinks that we're generating at the moment. So, you know, it's not just about quantity of links. It's about making sure we're hitting the right types of publications. Um, and that, you know, the clients are positioned how we want them to be. And due to the, you know, latest Google updates, it's all about showcasing expertise and experience as well as part of the content. So we're looking to do all these things. And uh, obviously, if we can drive referral traffic, increase organic traffic, et cetera, off the back of this, then, you know, we're winning even more. So it, it depends on the client, but these are the common things that we look at. Uh, a couple more questions just popped in. Um, so we've got a, a few more there. I'm going to rattle through this. this I'll, I'll give Julie and James a moment to catch their breath. Um, there's a question around a, a recent university graduate interest in digital marketing. Uh, what steps would you recommend to take and what specific skills should I focus on developing? Um, digital marketing is a big, a big place. I mean, we've spoken just about digital PR and influence today, but there's performance marketing, SEO, um, and, and all, you know, conversion rate optimization and, and, and lots of other bits and pieces. Um, I think my recommendation is, is, is get started somewhere and, and get a, get a foot in either with an agency, um, you know, that that's perhaps focusing on an area that you're interested in or, or at a brand smaller brand the better to be honest with you because then you'll get you know a lot of experience in a lot of different places um and then on the area that you want to focus on um uh, double down on that and, and try and sort of build an expertise on that um uh, i also think that you know creating your own side hustle or your your own sort of project on the side is a really really good way to not only develop your skills uh, but also at the same time as well um demonstrate to a prospective employer um, that you're willing to put the put the effort and the hard work in, um, and you'll you'll have an active and live case study. And if you're really good, you might not need an employer. Um, so just just to add to that, I think one of the skill sets we're often looking for is someone who's good with data. Data analysis in digital marketing is huge. Um, to you know, for strategy, um, for ideation, for measurement of campaign success across kind of most channels and for reporting and there's so much um, emphasis on return on investment you know especially with budgets kind of um you know under scrutiny at the moment if you can demonstrate the ability to you know be good with data then i think you'll do very well in digital marketing um and then uh, another one was how do you price your services when two campaigns um may require the same amount of work but generate different results um a short question but but a very very long answer probably required for this one um in a nutshell um you know growth per order of our pricing is is pretty much standard um you know influencer and paid is based upon a percentage of spend um creative and cro is done on more of a subscription model uh, truth be told we don't know how different the results are going to be um from the outset you, you know you don't know that until you get started um so best bet really um is to have somewhat uniform pricing um uh, across the board uh that's that's kind of our approach um jane i don't know if you're you're any different at uh, jbh yeah so obviously it's very hard to say what you can expect in terms of kind of success uh for different types of clients in different sectors every brand is very different and will have a different approach um, and some will be happy with some kind of campaigns and others wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. So it's ne it will never be a like for like situation, but we have different levels of pricing depending on your objectives and your budget and how competitive you want to be in uh, organic search. Um, but we also offer packages that come with a minimum link guarantee. So you've got, so you know what you can expect as a minimum from working with us. So it kind of helps to benchmark what we can offer um, compared to what others can offer too. Cool. Um, we've got four minutes left in, in two questions. So um, I'm, I'm going to take the second question first, which is, can you please share any examples of digital PR for any brand, any case studies? Um, so undoubtedly on the JBH website, there, there are examples of case studies, but um, 
I'll uh, let Jane know that you've asked this question and she can connect with you directly and send some other additional examples across. Um, and then the last question, I'm running an early stage startup. How early is it, uh, how early is it good uh, to seek PR? Um, so how early should you go in terms of sort of seeking PR? Still launching and involving the product at the moment. So when's a good time to, to look at digital PR for an early stage startup? I think as soon as you have a website that's live, as soon as you have somewhere to direct journalists to. Before that, there's no point because there's nothing for them to look at or link to. Um, so yeah, once you have your website set, set up, you know what you want to achieve. And obviously you have some money to invest in digital PR because it's not cheap, um, but it is worthwhile doing and it's worthwhile investing in as early as possible, especially if you're gonna be a challenger brand. And if you have something unique to say, then you're going to do very well from a PR perspective too. Amazing. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Julia, Jane, thank you both very much for your time. You. Um, just as a, a reminder to our guests, if you'd like to find a little bit more about either JBH or Growth Gorilla, you can visit our websites. Uh, Growth Gorilla is at growthgorilla.co.uk and JBH is at jbh.co.uk. Um, you can also reach out to us, um, funnily enough, either at hello at growthgorilla.co.uk <laughs> or at hello at jbh.co.uk. Um, and then last but not least, a shameless plug, uh, Growth Gorilla has an event on, uh, I think, the 12th of October. I may get shot by my marketing manager. I should know the you date. You are correct. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, hosted by Julia, um, all about community management and building a community. And we've got speakers from Shares, Uncapped, um, and then also we may have a couple of surprise guests as well. Um, that we're so just, surprised that I don't even know. <laughs> But we only found out about them today, um, and they're pretty cool. Tickets are there in the, the um, uh, in the channel if you'd like to take a look. Um, okay. Can but, I uh, can I do a shameless plug as yeah, well? Okay. Thank got, you. Three, three and a half more okay. minutes. So JBH has got two more webinars coming up. Uh, another one kind of mid September, which is on PR metrics, so how you can prove the value of your digital PR activity, which is proving very popular. We do have an events page on our website, so please check it out. And then we have another uh, PR webinar about tactics um, later on. I think that's like mid-October. So, yeah, we have an events page on the website, so please check it out because everything is on there. Amazing. Uh, once again, Jane, Julia, thank you both. And thanks, thank you for, all the and thanks for all the questions. Love it. Amazing. Thank you all very all much. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.